Possibly last orders at the Vic and EastEnders at 8 o'clock on BBC One Wales. Now, though, coming home. Making the journey into Wales from his home in Berkshire is rock and roll singer Shakin' Stevens. Real name Michael Barrett, he's travelled the world with his music career and now is home in Wales on the trail of his family ancestry. In a 40-year career, the 1980s alone saw Shaky spend the equivalent of five years in the UK singles chart, reaching the top 30 no less than 30 times. And he continues to win new fans, making him the household name he is today. But now, in search of his Welsh ancestry, there's an issue. Although I grew up in Wales, most of my roots are English. Shaky's earlier ancestors did indeed come from England, from Somerset, and from here in Shropshire, and the parish of Mainstone. But as he will discover, this is only a part of his family's hidden story. A story that will lead him to one of the most dramatic events in recent Welsh history, as Shakin Stevens is coming home. Later on this journey, Shaky learns of his grandfather's role in Britain's imperial past. That's quite heavy. In the sands of the Sudan. That's quite heavy. Yeah. Discovers the tragedies that beset his grandmother's life. Her life after that must have been wretched. And learns the final part of a moving family story. It's a horrible thing, war, isn't it? Dreadful. Singer Shakin Stevens grew up in Ely, Cardiff. His parents were Dad, Jack Barrett, a building site foreman who had fought in World War I, and Mum, Florence May Venables, a hospital cleaner. Shakey was the youngest of Florence and Jack's 13 children, with more than 20 years separating Shakey from the eldest of his brothers and sisters. Now on the road at the beginning of his journey, and Shaky is a little apprehensive. I am nervous, yeah, uh, but I'm excited at the same time. I'm very, very interested, uh, interested in uh, what one, one will find. He's traveling with a very special photograph. It's of his maternal grandparents, Charlotte and Herbert Venables, two people he never got to meet and is very keen to know more about. Okay, this is uh, Herbert and Charlotte, and it's my mum's parents. And uh, he's got some medals here. I'm afraid I don't know what these medals are for. Um, I thought you would tell me that as we go along. That's as much as I know about, about these fine-looking people. Shaky's family story begins in the town of pont de When his family first came to Wales in the 1880s, they headed here in search of work and a better life. And in the centre of town at Pontypridd's museum, Shaky is heading for a meeting with genealogist Mike Churchill Jones. Hi, Shaky. Hi. Welcome to Pontypridd Museum. We've been researching your family tree, and this is what we've come up with. Okay. Wow. Fantastic. Very impressive. Shaky's belief that his family originally came from England appears correct. Mike has traced his earliest ancestors to Shropshire and the parish of Mainstone where the family lived for many generations. It was not until the 1890s that his grandfather Herbert Venables moved to South Wales. Your grandfather Herbert Venables? Herbert, yeah. Yeah. The family lived in Caerphilly. He died in 1937, so you wouldn't have known him because obviously he died 11 years before he was born. Oh, definitely not. Herbert married Shakey's grandmother, Charlotte Quarterly. He had come to Wales from Shropshire, she from Somerset. Now, Charlotte Quarterly is the reason why we brought you to pont de Okay. She moved to pont de from Somerset in around about 1889. Herbert and Charlotte had a daughter, Florence May Venables, Shakey's mum, and a son, Leonard. But does Shakey know anything of his uncle Leonard or remember meeting his grandmother, Charlotte? No. I don't remember meeting uh, at all. Shaky's mother never spoke to him of his uncle Leonard. But why does he think this is? I suppose that was the 
the times of of the of the day really uh, uh, how it was. So Shaky really is on a journey into the unknown. By revealing the lives of the two people in this photograph, he will unlock so many of the untold stories from his family's past. In search of his grandfather, Herbert Venable's story, Shakey is traveling just across the Welsh border into Shropshire and the village of Mainstone, a place that would have been very familiar not only to his grandfather, Herbert, but also to Herbert's father, William, Shakey's great-grandfather. And just like Shakey, it appears William was something of a public performer. At Mainstone's primitive Methodist chapel, he meets with the Reverend Stephen Hatcher. We're, we're here in this chapel, which is a former primitive Methodist chapel, um, because your great-grandfather, William Venables, was a primitive Methodist local preacher um, and an agricultural labourer. Could you tell us, the, is there a difference between the primitive Methodist and Methodist. Yes, the, the, the primitive Methodists were a, a 19th century revival um, movement. In the 19th century, primitive Methodists felt compelled by their Christian beliefs to take more direct political action than their Methodist cousins. Their mission to help the working poor made them popular with farm laborers in places like rural Shropshire. Their worship often took place in large open-air prayer events conducted by charismatic preachers. Amongst them was Shakey's great-grandfather, William Venables. And they used to go out to the people, Join them, they? very much, uh, very much going out to the people. And we've got some vital information about his life on this object that I have here, uh, which is, as you'll see, the primitive Methodist preacher's plan for 1851 for the bishop castle circuit. Wow. The, this circuit plan shows all the places that they went out to. What we've got down here is a list of the preachers um, to start with and, and then we come to an on trial category, that means they're, <laughs> they're still being tested and then we here have a W Venables, that is without doubt um, William Venables, your great-grandfather. It's, it's not long before they send him to Mainstone, the very chapel um, that we're in, and it is your great-grandfather that's uh, here in this place, wow. uh, in charge of the service. Fantastic. William Venables was by no means Shakey's only ancestor in Mainstone. But what he doesn't yet know is that whilst one side of this parish is in England, the other half is in Wales, something that will prove significant in his story. First, he meets with Dr. Catherine Roberts from Cadw, who can explain the historic reasons why there's a border here. Welcome to Offers Dyke. Well, it's great to be here. <laughs> I mean, look at that view. It's fantastic, isn't it? It's and, great. Uh, this is the dike itself, just next to us, which is okay. probably the most famous historic monument to run through the parish of Maidstone, which is where your ancestors come from. Today, Offa's Dyke has come to symbolise the border between England and Wales, but was originally constructed over a thousand years ago between two distinct kingdoms. We're standing on the edge of two kingdoms. On that side, the Kingdom of Mercia, which was in England, or is where England is now. Yeah. And on this side, the Kingdom of Powys, which is part of Wales, and the Welsh kingdoms. And this marks the boundary between them. Ah. Of course, over time, the Welsh-English border has moved. So there are still stretches where it's very, very close to the border between England and Wales. But there are other sections where Wales has expanded and it's moved inland, and other sections which are, of course, in England. So it still is a border, in a way. My ancestors are from uh, Maidstone. So which side of the dike would they be? That side or this side? English or Welsh? Well, Maidstone parish extends across both sides but the town itself or the village is on the English side oh. so I suppose if they were born on that side that places them in the Mercian side in the English side okay so Shakey's ancestors were living right on the border with Wales something that may prove significant as the story moves even further back into his ancestral past 
but for the moment he's off to the nearby Shropshire town of Shrewsbury. He's here to continue on the trail of his great-grandfather William Venables and his family. He had a son, Herbert, Shakey's grandfather. And Shakey has always wanted to know about the medals Herbert is wearing in this photograph. In Shropshire's Shrewsbury Castle, there is a record of Herbert's earlier life as a soldier. In 1885, he found himself in the Sudan, Northeast Africa, involved in one of the more unusual adventures of the British Empire, as expert Peter Duckers can explain. Uh, he was in the 1st Battalion of the Shropshire Light Infantry, and he's wearing there... That was the medal. Exactly. Well, these are exactly the same type. Yeah. Each soldier was given uh, a medal for service in the Sudan. They were out there fighting a tribe called the Hadandawa, and uh, they were ferocious tribesmen, very, very highly respected warriors. But just why, in 1885, did Herbert find himself in the Sudan, in the northeast of Africa? A year earlier, Sudan's capital, Khartoum, was under the command of famous British officer, General Charles Gordon. But Gordon badly underestimated the strength of the local Mahdi forces. Khartoum was overrun, and Gordon killed. For the British, it was seen as a humiliating defeat. So an extraordinary plan was drawn up to retake Khartoum. The plan involved building a railway in Sudan from the Red Sea port of Suakin across 300 miles of desert, carrying troops and supplies inland towards Khartoum through the tribal lands of the Hadandawa people. Your grandfather would have been out there with the Shropshire Light Infantry as part of the garrison of the port, protecting the railway, going out on patrol to fight these tribesmen. He doesn't look a pushover, does he? They're not, they were, they were by no means pushovers, and although they were only armed with spears and shields and swords, mm. uh, they, see their, determination. Their, well, their reputation as fighters was mm. just second to none. And uh, these are some of the weapons that wow. the regiment brought back. These are tribal spears from the Hadandawa in the Sudan. Wow. Yeah, and uh, the famous Sudanese sword, the Kashgar, which they used as their main fighting weapon. So there we are. Brave though the Haddon Dower may have been, swords and spears were no match for British rifles. The counterbalance to all that, of course, was that your grandfather would have been trained to use one of these, which was the standard British rifle of the, the period, the Martini Henry, single shot, very accurate, long range, a really powerful weapon. So, you know, your grandfather would have had his fill yeah, of that's quite, carrying that, that around. That's quite the, heavy. In the sands of the Sudan. That's quite heavy. Yeah, so you say one shot. Yeah, you dropped it. Uh, how long would it take to... To, uh, to load? To reload, yeah. Take out, back in, off again, do the same. They reckon about 20 rounds a minute. The railway that Herbert was sent to protect was never built. The plan was abandoned but clearly he was proud of the medals he won in this imperial campaign. Well, thank you very much. Pleasure. Nice to see thank you. Thank you very, okay. very much. As well as Mainstone in Shropshire, Shakey's earlier ancestors in this area can also be traced to the nearby village of Kerry. And it's to Kerry that he's going next, and a visit to the parish church of St. Michael's. But unknown to Shakey, by travelling to this village, he's just crossed the border into Wales. And it's here in Kerry that genealogist Mike Churchill-Jones has traced Shakey's family back even further, all the way to his four times great-grandfather, one Richard Gwilt. This is his baptism record. His name is Richard, son of Francis Gwilt. And I'm excited to reveal to you that he was born and baptized in the very church you're standing in. What Mike has discovered is that Richard Gwilt, Shakey's four times great-grandfather, was Welsh, born on the Welsh side of the border in the mid-18th century. And he was not the only generation of the family from Wales. We've managed to research your Welsh Gwilt line back from your four times great-grandfather, Richard Gwilt, back to his great-grandfather, who was also a Richard Gwilt, and he was born in the early part of the 1600s. Which is 400 years. Yeah, so a lot more Welsh ancestry now for you to explore. Wow. Very impressive. That's fantastic. The story now moves to South Wales and Pontypridd. 
Shakey's grandfather Herbert came here in the 1890s and married Charlotte Quarterly. Charlotte Quarterly is Shakey's grandmother. She's the lady in the family photograph he's traveling with. He wants to know more about his grandmother's earlier life. In the 1880s, she came to Pontypridd from Somerset, along with her brother James. Ponty's old bridge in the center of town would have been a familiar sight to them. But what brought them here? Historian Dr. Louise Miskell has been looking into their story. Your grandmother came here in the late 1880s. At that time, Pontypridd would have been around about 20,000 population, which for Wales was quite a big town. Um, and I think the fascinating thing about Pontypridd is kind of a frontier town. It's on the border between, you know, the upland coal mining areas and the lowland urban areas. So it was really on the edge of different cultures. And lots of families like your grandmother Charlotte were coming from exactly Somerset in the southwest of England. That's right. Um, at that period. That's because, right. of course, there was so much work. That's right. Um, they, go, they went where the work uh, was, didn't they? They did. And you had Albion Colliery just up the road at Kilbanniv, yeah. which was one of the many steam coal collieries in this area. And there was such an appetite for Welsh steam coal yeah. in this period. Um, they were really looking for labour. Work was plentiful, relatively well paid, although, of course, it had its dangers as well. And there was an opportunity to you know, move into an industrial environment and come to a town like Pontypridd, which not only had employment, but it had all the shops and facilities of yeah. an urban area, you know, as well as the basic things like grocers and shoemakers and tailors. It had jewellery shops, upholsterers, watch and clock makers. There were just Turkish baths in Pontypridd in the 1880s, wow. believe it or not. I think she might have used those. Uh, <laughs> Maybe, it was quite a fashion Maybe. in the Victorian period. Um, and it was just an attractive, up-and-coming, vibrant sort of place. Wow. So it pulled them in, and many other families like them too. Shakey's grandparents, Herbert and Charlotte, married in 1906. But as Shakey is about to learn, this was not his grandmother's first marriage. At the Rhonda Heritage Centre, Mike Churchill-Jones has been looking into the archives to discover more of Charlotte's earlier life, along with her brother James. This is the 1891 census. You can see James's name on the bottom there and yeah. his wife. And I'm afraid it goes over the next page. Charlotte is a visitor. Also in the household is a Henry John Bale. Ah. Now, some four months later, Henry John Bale became Charlotte's husband. Ah. They married in the registry office in pont a So the second marriage, yeah. This is the uh, first marriage in. First marriage. Yeah. Once they married, they, stra they stayed in Trathlun and they moved to Middle Street, which is just around the corner from where Charlotte was living with her brother, James. Uh -huh. They were working just across the railway track in a colliery called the Albion Colliery in Kilvanid, little village just on the outside of pont a Now, life was going relatively well for them. But sadly, this was not to last. Mike has discovered that both Charlotte's new husband, Henry Bale, and her brother, James, were coal miners in the village of Kilvanith. In the 1890s, they were working at the Albion Colliery. To learn more of the jobs they were doing, Shaky goes underground at the Rhonda Heritage Center with expert Brian Davis. Your great uncle James was a ripper, so he was working in a roadway like this. A ripper's job would be to keep the roadways open. Henry is yeah. as a labourer, removing debris, uh, carrying materials for people who were setting uh, roof supports, pit props. On June the 23rd, 1894, Henry and James were working underground in the Albion Colliery, a fateful day in Welsh coal mining history. So they were underground on a Saturday afternoon and at about 10 to 4 in the afternoon, just under two hours after the shift started, people on the surface heard two loud explosions. The blast could be heard in the main high street of Kilbunneth. Hundreds of people would soon rush to the pithead. 
The men were 500 odd yards underground, but the blast could be felt up on the surface and a cloud of smoke came up one of the shafts. Huge gas explosions deep in the pit shaft signaled what would become one of the worst mining disasters in Welsh history. In all, 290 men and boys would lose their lives, some as young as 14. Dust, debris everywhere. Uh, coal dust, debris. They found bodies strewn everywhere. Right? Um, 16 men got out, 11 of those died. The bodies were taken up the following day. They were laid out in the hayloft uh, of the stables on the pit top. And they were so badly mutilated and covered with dust that people were mistakenly identifying the wrong bodies. Shaky's grandmother, Charlotte, would have had to identify the bodies of both her brother, James, and husband, Henry. Henry would never get to see their first child with whom she was pregnant. Kilvanith took many weeks to bury their dead. This photograph shows Philip Jones, who was the manager of the mine on the day of the accident. Charges were laid against key members of the management. The major charges were dropped by a local jury full of local mine owners and mining engineers. Right? The manager and one of his key officials were fined a total of 12 pounds. Mm, disgusting. For Shaky, this is the first time he's learned of his family's involvement in this dark day in Welsh history. I found this story very moving. In one fateful day, she lost all her family. Her husband, uh, and indeed her brother. Her life after that must have been wretched. Shaky was too young to remember his grandmother, Charlotte. She died when he was only a year old. But being one of 13 children means there are others in the family who do remember, including Shaky's older sister, Aileen. I do remember Charlotte, my grandmother. It's the first time Aileen's seen this photograph of her grandparents. She was a lovely lady and she wore a silk, a white silk scarf. And he's lovely, he is. Later, Aileen will be meeting up with little brother Shaky. But now the family story moves forward to 1914 and the outbreak of World War I. Shaky's grandmother Charlotte had remarried to Herbert Venables. Amongst their children was a daughter, Florence May, Shaky's mum, and her brother Leonard. But Shaky's mother had never spoken about her brother Leonard. So what became of him? At Pontypridd's museum, Shaky meets with historian Dr. Jonathan Hicks, who's been researching Leonard's story. Uh, Leonard enlisted, as you can see from the papers here, mm -hmm. in August 1914 in the Welsh Regiment. But he lied about his age. He did? Mm. They did that a lot, didn't they? They did that a lot to get in, because mm. they wanted to join up, and he wanted to fight at the front <coughs> with his mates. In 1914, Leonard tried to enlist, but was deemed unfit for duty. But he's not going to take no for an answer, because in January the following year, 1915, he tries again. <coughs> and he does become successful on this occasion, and he joins the Royal Field Artillery. Leonard was trained as a gunner and served on the Western Front. Wow. Millions and millions of rounds fired on the Western Front over a period of four years. And quite piercingly low, I would think, yeah. Mm. It would have been absolutely horrendous. Wow. He goes through all of that absolutely horrendous experience. And he's home in, on leave the following year, 1917. And that's when he marries his wife. He's met a lady called Mary Davis and he marries her on the 12th of May, 1917. So he has a bit of happiness in his life that up to that time has probably been absolutely awful in terms of his service on the Western Front. Also for Charlotte, after the many trials in her life, a moment of joy. 
she could witness her son's marriage. But soon Leonard would return to the front line, and Charlotte would never see her son again. Having been on his honeymoon for what it was oh, at the time, he then goes straight into the Battle of Passchendaele, which you may have heard of. Look at all the shells. And these are just some of the shells that the British fired in the last two weeks of July 1917. Two weeks? Yeah. Wow. Something like four million shells were fired. And your uncle, Leonard, was one of the gunners firing those shells. You can't really imagine what they went through, really. Not at you? all. It's a horrible thing, oh, though, isn't dreadful. it? Dreadful. Absolutely awful. By Christmas 1917, Leonard, who was now aged just 21, was about to face his final assault on the enemy. And then, on Christmas Day, 1917, they begin the move back into the front line. And this time, he's posted right at the edge of the Ypres salient, one of the most dangerous places on Earth at the yeah. time. And between the 5th and the 7th of January, 1918, there's an awful lot of artillery fire going from the British to the German lines, and the Germans are responding. And sometime during that period, your Uncle Leonard is wounded. He's then taken out of the front line to a casualty clearing station and then to a field ambulance. But unfortunately, he passes away on the 15th of January, 1918. And he's buried in a cemetery just west of Ypres in Belgium. Terrible. 11 days later, his wife, having had the letter from the war office informing her, her of her husband's death, gives birth to their son, uh. who she names Leonard Samuel Venables, your cousin. Shaky began this journey with a single photograph. A photograph of his grandparents, Charlotte and Herbert, whose lives he knew so little about. But why has he been so moved by what he's learned? More than anything, because of Charlotte. She lost her husband, a brother, just in one day. And now she's lost her son, Leonard. And my mum, had lost her brother. Shaky has learned so much on his journey that he'd like to share with his family. He's about to meet up with older sister Aileen and brother Les. I don't call him Shaky because I've always called him Michael. But in recent years now I've gone down to Mike. But I always give him the full, yeah, the full title, Michael. Shaky has quite a story to share with them. But first, there's the big reunion. Hello. 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 Well, what are you doing here? <laughs> At times, this has been a difficult journey for Shaky. It's been very emotional and uh, sometimes uh, very difficult. But of course, I'm, I'm, I'm really glad I, I, I did it. For Aileen and Les, the story starts with their grandmother, Charlotte Quarterly. Oh, Quarterly, this Charlotte Quarterly, yeah. Yeah. That's, that's Charlotte Quarterly. Who's that? At the start, Shaky believed he had little Welsh ancestry. It's funny, really, how I've thought of my ancestors as English. But what about now? And I feel I've come home. And the series concludes next Monday night on BBC One Wales with John Humphreys at half past seven.